for those of us who are resistance training as well, is there um, an acute anabolic timing window where we have a certain amount of time where the muscle, let's say, is more receptive to substrate for remodeling? Yeah. So the that post-exercise anabolic window concept, we we have to kind of go back into the into history and sort of talk about how it came about and how it evolved into the you know physical culture because um, it's important to know those things to be able to understand why everybody's trying to get that that way and dextrose down you know as soon as possible afterwards so this is rooted in research back in the late 80s by uh, John Ivey and, and and Robert Portman, where they were looking at the rate of glycogen, so glycogen being the stored form of carbohydrate in the muscle and in the liver, but in this context, stored carbohydrate in the muscle. How can we resynthesize that? How can we restock that as quickly as possible once we've depleted that? So what they did was they would compare two groups of people. So this is after an overnight fast, they would deplete glycogen in in both groups. So they would put them through almost two hours of continuous um, moderate and high intensity uh, cycling, almost two hours of it, tap out glycogen in the quads, and then measure the rate of glycogen resynthesis from either immediate carbohydrate intake, like a substantial amount of immediate carbohydrate intake, or a a significant delay in carbohydrate intake, let's say a two hour delay, three hour, four hour delay. And and they would just measure the rate of glycogen restocking in those, those two models, the immediate carbohydrate model and the delayed carbohydrate model. And predictably, if you delay carbohydrate intake, then at let's say the four hour mark or the eight hour mark, you may have significantly less restocked carbohydrate or glycogen within the muscles. So the importance of this and the application of this really only comes down to endurance athletes who rely on glycogen availability for um, exercise performance. And this really only applies when you look at a, a short time frame, like eight hours. That really only applies to days where you have more than one glycogen depleting event, like a multi-stage endurance race, like triathlon, for example. Um, so the original post-exercise anabolic window had everything to do with restocking glycogen as quickly as possible because you, number one, you depleted it in the first place with an exhaustive endurance type of uh, activity. And secondly, you were going to use those same glycogen depleted muscles within the same day to compete again. So that is the root of the post-exercise anabolic window. It had everything to do with um, endurance competition. And so what happened from that point was John Ivey and Robert Portman et al. started looking at um, post-exercise protein and carbohydrate and how that affects muscle protein synthesis. And so what they... protein, like a small amount of protein and um, a large amount of carbohydrate, then you can elevate muscle protein synthesis to a higher degree than having carbohydrate by itself. And so they're saying, aha, so now we know how to restock glycogen as quickly as possible by having a highly glycemic, quickly as or highly insulinemic carbohydrate source ASAP after training, and that will restock glycogen the fastest. And now we're looking at muscle protein synthesis, which should kickstart the recovery and growth process of muscle, muscle tissue. And, and so, Hey, we've, we've found the Holy grail here. What you need to do is have a quickly digesting protein and a quickly digesting carbohydrate source. And hopefully in the, uh, or, you know, optimally in this liquid solution as soon as possible post-exercise. 
because if you miss that window, then you're going to compromise recovery, you're going to compromise growth, and you're going to compromise just the optimal adaptations to training. And so that was the that was the theory. Okay, so that was back in um, the early 2000s when they put out their book Nutrient Timing. When Portman and Ivy put out their book Nutrient Timing. And so what happened from the early 2000s to the late 2000s, you know, starting breach the 2010s, what happened was a series of studies that essentially tested out that hypothesis, the anabolic window hypothesis. And the way that they tested it out is they compared different timing schemes of protein relative to the training bout. So um, whereas it was a known thing that glycogen restocking happens maximally if you don't wait and you have a highly insulinemic, highly glycemic carbohydrate source, um, what wasn't mm, strongly established was the protein timing thing for muscle growth. So from the early 2000s to the late 2000s, we tested this out through, not we, not my group. My group actually came in uh, in 2013, 2014, and we started testing this out after we saw that there, that the results were inconsistent. Um, people were growing just the same, whether they consumed protein immediately after training or whether they waited, you know, a couple of hours to have their protein after training. They, they were having the same degree of muscle size and strength gains. And so my colleagues and I, we took a look at all the research, like over, over a dozen studies that looked at protein timing and the so-called anabolic window. And we found that it actually didn't matter when relative to the training bout that you consume protein as long as total daily protein was 1.6, 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. And so, you know, for, for the listeners, a meta analysis is when you look at multiple studies and you pool the findings together, you pool the, the results together and you get kind of an aerial view or a read on what direction the evidence leans, you know, is it in favor? Is it leaning in favor of the, uh, the narrow post-exercise anabolic window or is it not? And we found that it now it, it it didn't. And so what my colleagues and I did was we decided to test out that idea directly. And so we ran a randomized controlled trial that compared immediate pre-exercise feeding with immediate post-exercise um, feeding of protein of um, 25, 25 grams of protein in a within a liquid, MRP type meal. So it was protein um, and in, in a liquid, a quickly absorbed form. And there was no difference in muscle size and strength gains over a period of weeks with immediate pre-exercise protein feeding versus immediate post-exercise protein feeding. And so um, any we- subjective, Any subjective performance differences? No, <laughs> no, not even that. The strength gains were the same. And, and by the way, we also did a study that compared fed cardio with fasted cardio on um, body composition, and we found no and, difference either. And no difference. So that's, that's kind there of an aside. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, yeah no, no difference with it with fed and fasted cardio. But so, all right, so back to the, the, this anabolic window uh, concept, the post-exercise anabolic window concept, we always kind of doubted it for one because the studies from the early 2000s to the late 2000s were showing that it doesn't doesn't matter and number two when you think about the timing of of your meals you're really shooting to achieve nutrient availability in the blood so it's not about when you actually consume this the the food it's when those downstream metabolites, those nutrients, when they show up in, in maximally in blood circulation. And so whenever you consume a meal, those blood substrates are going to become maximally available in like <laughs> at, 
at soonest, like 45 minutes. So about an hour is when amino acids peak in the blood after a good hit of protein. So we're thinking, gosh, you know, like why are people so focused on the post-exercise window and getting it in like what you experienced within like, you know, 15, 30 minutes of your workout. When, when you do that, those substrates are going to peak in the blood an hour later. Right. So it's more like if you want to take advantage of the anabolic window, then think more in terms of substrate av availability in the blood. So like the pre-exercise meal, if you have, let's say 30, 45 grams of protein, um, let's say a quickly digesting protein that who is going to have amino acid levels peak in the blood, like 45 to 60 minutes later. Um, you know, if you have that pre-exercise, then that kind of becomes the, uh, the post-exercise meal. If you're, if you have it immediately pre and your training bout is about an hour, then you've kind of created this ideal post exercise <laughs> right environment. it's available once you're done i love yes, that it's available once you're done mm -hmm. and so um what we concluded is that look if you want to nitpick and you want to take advantage of these temporal opportunities to optimize nutrient availability then you would basically stick your workout in between two nutrient dose in between two protein rich meals that's that way you're covering all your bases. If you really want to, um, you know, if you really want to pull all the stops. And so, um, I have this, I, I said this on, on, on the forums and it kept getting quoted. So if you're still burping up your pre-workout meal, when your workout is over, then chances are you don't need to run to the locker room and slam your way dextrose shake right. because, you know, you've already created this anabolic environment post-exercise with your pre-exercise meal. So just kind of boiling things down to practical terms, it's like the peri-exercise period, in quotes, is the period between um, your two protein feedings, okay, the, that the pre-exercise protein feeding and the post-exercise protein feeding. And we're talking protein now because carbohydrate is mainly more, it, it's more of a, uh, an endurance type of thing, mainly a, an athletic performance type of thing where glycogen is depleted. And with resistance training, you'd be lucky to tap out 40% of your glycogen, um, even with a decently high volume of sets. So, um, the peri exercise period, try not to stretch that out more than, more than I would say four to five Hour, four to five hours, six hours at the most, if if your goal is to gain muscle. So the exercise bout would be it be in between in the, the peri-exercise period, which is framed by these two protein feedings. Try not to stretch that peri-exercise window more than about five, six-ish hours. And that's really all you need to, to care about. Um, you don't have to care about this narrow 30-minute, 45-minute, 60-minute post-exercise anabolic window, although I would add to that, Stephanie, that the people who do um, slam their whey dextrose shake post-exercise, they're not doing anything bad. They're not harming anything. It's just that it's not necessarily doing doing anything better than just, ha you know, having yeah. a regularly scheduled set of meals.